Hello my friends and welcome back. It's Tuesday, so happy Tuesday to you. I gotta begin with a sort of an apology because I made a mistake in the previous video and it was not a minor mistake but a pretty big one. 10% of my channel's viewers are from England. I said that a uh, few countries have not allowed their weapons to be used in Ukrainian soil and that's a very big thing, Ukrainians need that, almost as much as the F-16. I also mentioned that one of these countries is uh, United Kingdom, but I was wrong, I was very wrong, so wrong, the United Kingdom has allowed their weapons to be used on Russian soil. And to just clear everything up, here is a list of countries who have allowed their weapons to be used on Russian soil. And these countries, I would say, are bearing the brunt of the responsibility in Russia's eyes, so they're very brave. And I really respect people from these countries because they have elected the politicians who have made these decisions. Sweden, Great Britain, yes, my big mistake. Finland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Czech Republic, but that's not it, don't worry, don't worry, it's not it. Netherlands and Poland also. Now if I skipped any right now, there's this list always renews because countries are joining this coalition uh, of superstars, so if I missed your country, please spam it in the comments. Please accept my apology. All, all Great Britain citizens. My friends, this next news is bombshell of a news. You are not ready for it and I was not ready for it. France is sending troops on the ground to Ukraine, soldiers to Ukraine, not only soldiers but actually the Foreign Legion. You have all heard about the French Foreign Legion. If you have, you know their reputation. It is the reputation, they're one of the best fighting forces in the world. They will be in Ukraine. Now before you go to comment, but Arthur, they will only be instructors, they will only be teaching Ukrainian soldiers. Yes, my friends, they will be instructors. And officially, France will send instructors to Ukraine and to Western Ukraine. But the thing is, all of these instructors are expert soldiers from the Foreign Legion. So it is the Foreign Legion and they bring with them all, all their soldiering capabilities. They are expert soldiers. So if there's any kind of attacks, missile attacks to Western Ukraine and they get killed, that brings France to this war much closer. It's the French victims, the French soldiers who might die now. It's the French, French military is now directly involved with this war. So who says they're not to escalate even further, saying, okay, now we will deploy our foreign legion instructors to the front lines. And bear in mind, these instructors are soldiers with guns, with all of their skills. They can fight very well. This was promised before by French President Emmanuel Macron and now it has been confirmed by Ukrainian Chief of Staff of the Army, General Sirsky. Now, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania and Poland have said that if Russia makes any kind of a significant breakthrough to Ukrainian defenses, they will send, or we will send, it's my country also, troops on the ground in Ukraine. Well, the French beat us to it and I'm glad. Merci. French people, merci French soldiers and French politicians who are responsible for this decision. This shows to Russian leadership that their red lines mean nothing and they will have to play according to our red lines. We set the boundaries because we are stronger. Now, what are the few outcomes of this decision? First of all, Russia has a decision whether to deliberately target these French instructors or not. They can because they probably will know where they are well, that's how it is. It's quite hard to send a bigger amount of troops or instructors into a country without anybody noticing. So, they will possibly target Western Ukrainian draining fields with missiles, which means there might be French Foreign Legion casualties, which means a lot to the French military, which gives uh, the politicians a political will and incentive to let's use Russian words then, escalate even further, send more troops, send more weapons, send more everything, put their full might behind Ukraine. So there are a few outcomes to this, this is one of them, many different, many more things that now can evolve out of control, let's say. We don't know the outcomes of this decision, but they are not predictable. 
from this moment, anything can happen. My friends, there are discussions among NATO militaries, especially closest to Ukraine, for forming an air defense shield over Western Ukraine. Now, this could be done by air defense batteries deployed in Poland, for example, and Romania, which don't enter physically into Ukraine, but their air defense capabilities cover part of Western Ukraine, so they could start doing that, start shooting down Russian missiles and drones that just are in the range of their air defense systems. I am all for it. All of the Baltics are all for it, and Poland, of course, but this should be a unified NATO decision. This is just a discussion right now. There is no indication that this is actually happening. It's just an idea on the table. We'll see. Time will tell where this will go. Estonia, Great Britain, Poland, Canada, Lithuania and France are in favor of expanding aid against the United States and Germany. There are no final decisions yet, but negotiations are underway on several areas. First of all, training of soldiers of the armed forces of Ukraine by NATO instructors on territory of Ukraine, which actually is now happening by the French Foreign Legion. Number two, logistics. A number of NATO countries are ready in the future to deliver weapons and ammunition not only to the border of Ukraine, but also further to the front line. So the logistics, I mean, any army in the world only fights as good as their logistics is, or as Napoleon said, a soldier fights on his stomach. That means if you improve Ukrainian logistics, meaning you're not directly involved in Ukraine in direct lethal aid, how to say this? Only logistics, only delivering ammunition or transporting food, you still give Ukraine a huge fighting capability because you relieve their manpower from logistical tasks that they can now focus on the front line more, focus on offensive operations, for example. And number three, air defense. These are all the topics that are on the table with discussions with NATO powers right now. Defense of the airspace of Western Ukraine by NATO anti-aircraft systems is being discussed. Poland is the initiator of expanded air defense, but there is no final decision yet. So anyone who thinks, okay, Ukraine is about to lose and uh, Western powers are weak and uh, tired, I'm just bringing these topics into light that these are the discussed topics. France is already sending troops, troops to Ukraine. The Baltics have promised that if there is a breakthrough, they will send troops to Ukraine. There are long-term bilateral uh, security treaties signed, for example, yesterday by Spain and before it was France and Great Britain and Poland. Europe is behind Ukraine in long term long term. We're talking about a decade and longer. Now, my friends, a little bit of a eye candy for you. Actually, not eye candy. I see a fucking drone there. Drones struck Putin's palace. You know that very famous Putin's palace that uh, Navalny brought into light? The video got like 100 million views when he revealed that Putin is building that gazillion dollar palace with the bribe money or stolen money from the Russian people. Anyway, this palace was attacked by a drone uh, by Gur. This signals to Putin personally that they know where it is and they're going to strike it and they have information about it. And Putin doesn't really want to live in that palace if he knows that Gur is just able to strike it. Why build a multi-billion gazillion dollar palace if you cannot live in there because you have constant paranoia that Gur is going to send a drone your way? So this one small drone, yeah, it's not going to destroy the palace. But the paranoia it installs in Putin's mind is endless. So this is pure gold for me. Look at it. Looks like uh, the Sun King of France, Louis XIV, whatever king you're going to say from the 14th, 15th century. This is a palace nobody needs. No man alive needs a house like that. You cannot live in a million rooms, you need only one. The governor of the Krasnodar region reported that drones debris damaged an unfinished building in the village of Grinitsa. Another drone flew into the form of 
Chankot, located very close to Putin's palace. The target of the drones could be Putin's palace in Gelenjik, which is located very close to the farm. In Grinitsa, there are vineyards and winery, which may belong to the residents of the Russian dictator. Wow, 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 very nice. Now, my friends, I'm, I'm going to touch upon the topic that you have been commenting on for a long time, and there's a huge part in this topic uh, for Russian disinformation. Also, there's a huge part of truth in this, and this is Russian jamming and more more likely Russian jamming of HIMARS. I'm going to go through all of it and part of my resource, uh, and some parts of my resources are soldiers on the front and also soldiers part of the HIMARS crew. I've spoken to them in Kiev. They all say different stories and the truth is in the middle. This is what I'm going to give you. What is truth and what I can say is less than 10% of effectiveness of Excalibur. Excalibur is then guided artillery rounds which were very deadly and effective at the beginning months when they were given But lately they have lost 90% of their effectiveness due to Russian jamming. I can confirm this with my sources also This is true, but this is also HIMARS. Now it is not that true Hold your horses on HIMARS and other high-precision Western weapons due to Russian electronic warfare the effectiveness of the projectiles of HIMARS has also decreased. Now here is the truth. It has decreased, but it's definitely not comparable to Excalibur because Excalibur is jammed so heavily, the United States just stopped delivering Excalibur to Ukraine because it's just converted into a dumb artillery round because it's being jammed so heavily. Now what's with Russian jamming? NATO has always focused on aerial superiority and they're really good with it. For the last 60, 70 years, NATO countries and NATO air forces have been superb and leading in the world. Russia and the Soviet Union have always focused on electronic warfare systems uh, and ra radio systems. They are very good with it and ahead from NATO countries. European Union, no NATO country in the European Union has such jamming capabilities as Russia does. Their jammers are superb, very strong and ahead of other countries, you could say that. We are the reacting side, we are trying to develop jammers just like the Russian jammers, while Russians are trying to develop drones just like Ukrainian drones. In different areas, different countries are leading. But when it touches the jamming, they have done it from the 70s and they are very effective with it. Why some HIMARS munitions are jammed and some not? The truth is that the jamming, when it is done by Russians, when they have a, a jammer in an area, a very strong one, then it works. It does jam HIMARS, it does jam Excalibur, but it's they take an immense amount of energy, like a huge, massive amount of energy. It's very difficult to do uh, the strong jamming on a wide frequency without having a damn power plant. So this is why they can do in, in, in Kaliningrad, because it's a stationary jammer, they can just puke out all of these frequencies and they have infinite power there, pretty much, with electricity-wise. They don't have that on the front, so they can pretty much jam on the front with the power of car batteries or something a little bit stronger, generators perhaps, but this also is very limited. So when they do it, a few square kilometers is truly filled with Russian jamming. Yes, you cannot fly anything there or shoot anything there, but HIMARS, my friends, it shoots into the depth. Russian jammers are expensive and limited. Even they have an issue with producing them because they're not a mass producible thing. They're running out also like Ukraine. So, like they cannot protect their huge, vast country and the uh, important locations with air defense, same goes to jamming. So, if Ukraine strikes Russian frontline positions with HIMARS, these munitions can be jammed and they will be jammed. If they strike something in the depth with HIMARS where there are no Russian jamming, and usually there are not, because Russia just doesn't have these j strong jammers everywhere laying around, then HIMARS is pinpoint again. So there's a uh, truth is split, as you can see. This is why Ukraine is using HIMARS now very deliberately in an area where they suspect there are no Russian jammers, and usually all of the jammers are in the front line, all of them. 
So if you strike in the depth, in the rear areas of the Russian army, you don't have to be afraid of the jamming because they are focusing their capabilities on the front line. That's where the truth is. But now there's more to this story. Now, okay, uh, Excalibur, they need to be uh, redesigned, re... Um, they need some redeveloping done to face the Russian jamming. HIMARS also. But United States has a surprise weapon that even they, they were not aware that was so successful against Russian jamming. And this is the GBU-39 SDB Precision Guided Glide Bomb. Or small diameter bomb as people just like to call it. And you can see it on these photos actually. There are like plenty of them on this plane. And A-10 Warthog, the, that kind of plane, love that plane, can carry about 15 of these glide bombs and they are precise and they are not, uh, they're not being jammed currently. It looks like that and if you release it, it has little wings and it glides down, much like Russian bombs, glide bombs that are very cost effective, cheap to make, mass producible, very deadly. These are the American versions of it, and America has a gazillion of them. It's beautiful, because they have so many of them in the storage. Russian defense industry has seen a few tangible successes in this war, but the glide bombs stand out as a notable achievement. These cost-effective weapons efficiently inflict substantial damage at the front lines. Confirmation has been received that Ukraine's MiG-29 fighter jets are capable of deploying... Uh, GBU-39 precision guided glide bombs, the American small diameter bombs, that could be the American counterpart of the Russian FABs, the glide bombs. Ukraine encountered problems with the Russian jamming on the GLSDB, so ground launch small diameter bomb, joint development of Boeing and Saab, hyped up and then a uh, major failure due to Russian jamming. They were so acceptable for it, they pretty much couldn't be used. They couldn't hit the targets at all. So they need redevelopment redeve by months, a lot of months. Russian jamming has added months to American precision guided weaponry that proves, that proves vulnerable to Russian jamming. But there is one exception. This is the small diameter bomb. It just goes right through it, doesn't care at all. So, and there's plenty of them. So, if F-16s arrive, you know, the issue with the MiG-29s, and they can shoot the small diameter bombs, but they're MiG-29s, you know, they are uh, not last generation, but before the last generation, they can be shot down. So, Ukraine needs something more modern, something that is harder to detect by Russian radars and harder to shoot down with more capabilities. And that is the F-16. And we, if you combine the small diameter bomb with the F-16, so a non-jammable bomb, by far at least, with, let's say, modern NATO aircraft that is much harder to shoot down and detect by Russian radars, you get a killer force. You get a force multiplier. So this is where I'm putting my cards on and it feels like it will be a notable change on this war. Russia then has to adapt again big time. They have to push their logistics back. They cannot use their glide bombs that effectively. That changes the Ukrainian losses on the defensive positions. Perhaps Ukraine can conduct even offensive operations. It changes everything. But my friends, now we have a new record from GUR. According to sources from the Ukrainian military intelligence, GUR, their drone attacked a Russian long-range radar near the city of Orsk in the Orenburg region. The distance from the Ukrainian border to this facility is 1,800 kilometers. That is the new record. If we have the Guinness World Records guy here, that's the new GUR record. And the drones have not reached this far before. Theoretically, this could have been a special forces operation on Russian territory, but uh, so far in the back, I don't think so. Maybe uh, partisans. Two days ago, Russian media reported that a crashed Ukrainian drone was found in this area, which did not hit the target. The mentioned radar is a very important tool for the Russian space forces. Yes, Russia has space forces. Before you laugh, they do. Yes. 
uh, I saw this graph uh, yesterday that Intel, the chip maker company, is worth what, two point six trillion dollars now. Correct me here if I'm wrong. Way over a trillion dollars, and a whole Russian economy is like six hundred billion. So they have. A space force, although even one American company is much more bigger and valuable than the whole Russian economy and country. Well, this was a Russian space force radar, used to monitor objects in space in the Earth's atmosphere. The visibility range of this radar complex is up to 6,000 kilometers. Ukraine is taking these out. This is not an isolated event. I don't know if, if it's the United States who is asking Ukraine to do this, but this degrades Russian early warning capabilities. And this is connected to nuclear capabilities. It has nothing to do with this war, almost nothing. And they're taking them out. So I think there's a United States wish that's, uh, that these radar, uh, you know, do what you want, but just destroy that one and then that one. And because it's not like you can just build a new one. These take years to build and develop and the teams take years to train this is this is a loss you cannot replace now my friends i'll top, touch upon a topic that uh, i'm definitely not an expert on and if i make any mistakes please collect me in the comments but this is important it's very much connected to russo ukrainian war china is preparing a large navy to inv invade taiwan Beijing has a shortage of amphibious assault ships, so basically troop carriers and infantry fighting vehicle carriers, just ships that carry their land army. So civilian vessels will be used as military vessels. They can be used in combat after the destruction of coastal defenses for massive or for massive pressure. Landing under fire is one of the most difficult military maneuvers. The publication reveals that China is capable of moving 300,000 vehicles across the Taiwan Strait in 10 days. Now, this is the official reports of the Chinese capabilities. I would take this with a grain of salt. I mean, many of you guys have commented this before and actually read about an analysis. Taiwanese Strait, the, the water body itself is pretty stormy, pretty rough waves. It's, uh, what is it, close to 100 kilometers? 90 kilometers long, carrying a massive land army over that strait is <laughs> near impossible, it, under fire. If you have months to do that, you can do it slowly. But if you have to do it within days, under fire, it's near impossible. Building out a fleet with such capabilities is near impossible. It's American intelligence suggests that the Chinese president has ordered the army to be ready to seize the island by 2027. Yes, that's the order. But China is, on paper at least, it's communist. Of course, well, it's a capitalist system like everything else. It's run by money. But on paper, they're communist. And in the communist system, it's quotas. And you got just, if the president gives the order, you've got to do the order no matter what. So they will just like fix up something and say that, okay, this civilian vessel is ready to carry one million troops. Here you go, Mr. President. In reality, the real capability of carrying 300,000 vehicles, yes, vehicles, across the Taiwanese Strait, under fire, within 10 days, that capability, China doesn't have it now. They will not have it in 10 years. That's what I believe. Call me naive. But that is... Um, a capability that only United States has right now and China is not even close. Of course, anything you write in the comments, I will be reading and I will be educating myself. Now, my friends, I'll show you fireworks. We go to Luhansk city. Look at the fireworks. Bavovna, beautiful. Last night, the Ukrainian army attacked an industrial area in the occupied city of Luhansk with Atakums missiles, the very same missiles that are jammed all the time. Well, Luhansk is a little bit behind the front, so Russia does not have jamming capabilities there because they're focusing them on the front. And even then, only some areas of, th of the front are jammed because... The capabilities are not laying on the ground. You cannot just take a million jamming vehicles or jamming stations and hook them up to generators and just fill all the area. You can only jam a very limited pinpoint area unless you have a huge power plant to be connected to a huge stationary jammers of wide frequency. And then you can just puke out frequencies like in Kaliningrad Oblast. 
But yes, Luhansk was attacked with attack arms with pinpoint accuracy. Whoa, 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 whoa. Prelim preliminary data indicates that Russian air defense systems S-300 and S-400 were located there. This industrial area was involved in helicopter maintenance and repair and was presumably meant to protect this very important facility for the Russian army. According to initial information, a second missile attack occurred later in the area of the Luhansk airport. So, the f huge fireball you see, it's the helicopter maintenance area. Then this video where camera pans around and you can see fire everywhere, this is the Luhansk airport. Both of them were attacked with attackums, both of them pinpoint accuracy and huge destruct destruction followed. Beautiful fireworks. Now, my friends, I just want to show you this chart because I do feel proud. And all of the countries who are in this list, I, I feel combined proudness of us all because we are doing it. We are the coalition of the defenders of democracy. Estonia, Denmark, Lithuania, Latvia, Finland, Poland, Slovakia, Sweden, Czechia, Netherlands. Look at that. That is the chart of aid given to Ukraine according to the country's GDP. And Estonia is leading. 1.6% of our entire GDP given to Ukraine. Also, we have adopted a resolution in the country that every year we will give 0.25% of the GDP to Ukraine. Now, if every country in the European Union would do that, <laughs> Ukraine could damn well take Moscow. Unfortunately, right now, Estonia is doing that only. I invite other countries also to do this. But all of these countries you see in this list, top 10 here, they're carrying the bulk of the weight because GDP shows a pressure on a, a, a one citizen. Pressure, economic pressure of this decision to one citizen. So Estonian citizen is carrying the most of the weight, economic weight for by percentage. Of course, United States and Germany have given billions, but it doesn't affect their citizens at all because it's nothing compared to the GDP. Now, my friends, for the second time of this week, my favorite part of the video, which is butchering the Buy Me A Coffee names. If you want your names to be butchered to oblivion in a way that your ears will bleed, then this is how I show my thanks to you for supporting the channel. Let's begin. Sean Ravin. Tiktoni Boy. Rupert at Rupert.id.au. Jan Suhr. Mikhail Skumacher. Larry Valkeinen, Jochen Scott, Ian McDiarmid, Tave, Jens. Thank you to these people. And if you want to be in this list of butchered names, become a monthly member of Buy Me A Coffee. Link is in the description below. Until my next video, my friends, Slavo Ukraine and bye bye.